thanks everyone for joining today's Adelaide Biomed City Mini Review. Uh, I'm Peter O'Loughlin from SA Pathology. Um, our presenters today are from SA Pathology and more specifically the Centre for Cancer Biology, which is um, an alliance between SA Pathology and the University of South Australia. Uh, each of the presentations today will be eight minutes, followed by five minutes of discussion. For all those who want to participate in the discussion uh, at the end of each presentation, uh, please type your questions and comments into the Q&A section, which you'll find at the bottom of the Zoom window. Uh, and uh, just so you know that this session is being recorded and will be made available on the uh, ABMC website uh, in the near future. So our first speaker today is Dr. Pierre Arts. Uh, Pierre studied and worked at Radboud University in Nijmegen in the Netherlands and is now postdoctoral fellow in molecular biology, um, uh, sorry, in molecular pathology uh, at the Centre of um, Cancer Biology. The title of his presentation today is A National Genomic Autopsy Study of Perinatal Death. Thanks, Pierre. I'm going to give a brief overview on our project called A Genomic Autopsy of Perinatal Death, which is led by Professor Hamish Scott uh, from the Center for Cancer Biology and Dr. Barnett at the Women's and Children's Hospital. Uh, very needle that the clinical uh, 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 description is um, a loss of a pregnancy or termination of pregnancy or neonatal death. Uh, uh, clinical evaluation of these cases currently um, includes the taking family history, medical imaging, and laboratory testing, and surgical pathology. In about 60% of cases, uh, the clinical cause is determined as congenital abnormality, perinatal infection, or unexplained. So the cases that are included in our project uh, are there in cases which no uh, cause can be identified by standard of care testing, such as karyotype and microarray or gene panel. So, this, so these would come into our gene, genomic autopsy to get exome or genome sequencing. The evolution of a project goes back eight years when cases will grow up before it ad hoc and with help from several funding bodies and Australian genomics we've been able to begin a national recruitment of cases. Uh, and then this year we've received an MRF grant uh, in which we propose to move to a uh, genomic autopsy to towards uh, the clinic which will be av available for everyone. So, so just as an overview of what we've worked on so far, um, in the genomic autopsy we'll, we will receive samples from uh, fetuses and their parents, and we do a trio sequencing um, after DNA extraction to identify a gen genetic cause for the, uh, the disorder or the death of the baby. Um, when, so far, we've analyzed 118 families. 26% of these <laughs> resulted in an obvious diagnosis classified by the ACMG guidelines. And for another 34%, we've identified in candidate variants we wanted to pursue further. Uh, these candidate variants follow up. Uh, have led to, to uh, novel genes or the expansion of known phenotypes for the um, disease genes. And I will explain later how that works. 
so uh, as I generally we've identified uh, 12 ghost or, or candidate variants in uh, novel disease genes. 19% expanded the phenotypic spectrum of the known homing disease genes. And six families have been reduced their genetic diagnosis for informed management of uh, future pregnancies. Um, interestingly, only two families had the same um, diagnosis or, or mutations in the same gene. So, so when we break down the diagnostic yield in the clinical features, such as the number of congenital abnormalities and the possible recurrences, it's, an, it's expected that the uh, cases with multiple abnormalities and um, recurrent uh, that have the highest self rate. Next would be the case of single abnormalities. And where we can definitely improve is the yield for, for isolated cases without congenital abnormalities. And for this, we may think about looking at placental abnormalities in future projects. As an example of our candidate variant follow-up, we now do genetic matchmaking uh, using a matchmaker tool or gene matcher. Uh, and we can also do targeted communication. So for, for two brothers here in Adelaide, of, of family here in Adelaide, indicated by the two, two black boxes here, they were affected with uh, accumulation in the, in the thoracic cavity known as non-immune fetal hydrops and cryothorax. We had identified candidate variants in the uh, potential novel disease gene called MDFIG. Contacted an expert in the field who is uh, Mika Picula in Belgium, and he had uh, three more families who with uh, similar mutations in the same gene and a similar phenotype. To gain even more evidence in a biological Chance, uh, mice models were developed in, co in collaboration with uh, Natasha Harvey here at the Center for Cancer Biology. Uh, and then that mice showed uh, dilated and um, ruptured um, lymphatic vessels, which would underlie chiroid uh, thorax. And the, the, similar to the humans, it's a very severe and lethal condition. We are currently in the process of finalizing this paper. So then next to the genetic work, we can look at the more microbial work if we do genome sequencing. So from genome sequencing, we can map the reads that don't map to the human genome to the microbial genome. And that's how we can detect possible bacteria, viruses, and fungi. As of a pilot, we looked at known cases from microbiology in which the baby has died from, from a perinatal infection, and we were able to identify all gram-negative bacteria. But when we compare that to other rooms, no results we selected, we were unable to detect gram-positive bacteria. And for some of the unknown cases that were did not have the better genome identified by normal uh, microbiology, uh, we, we were able to find it by genome sequencing. 
So what has some benefit to this, uh, it also still has limitations. And when we looked into it, it became to realize that it's basically because of the cell wall and the positive bacteria that, that doesn't allow us to detect the, the, all of the pathogens. So when we move forward, uh, after this is into the clinic, uh, and let's assume that everything goes well, but, uh, there's still some fields where we can improve, like uh, clinically, uh, the, the, um, the current early miscarriages, as I mentioned, we can do placental gen genomics, there's no new novel technologies like optical mapping and um, long read sequencing, and we want to expand on the pilot on mixed genomics for perinatal infections. We've also become part of a fetal genomics consortium in which we are going to collaborate with international groups to solve the loss of babies for even more families. Of course, this is done by lots of people who, who I want to thank. I also want to thank everyone in the uh, genetics and molecular pathology, tissue pathology and clinical and genetics services here in Adelaide. And if there's any questions, you can ask them now or email them to us. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Pierre. Uh, that was a fascinating talk. I, I really uh, enjoyed that. Thank you very much. I don't have any questions um, in the uh, Q&A box, but uh, I think we've probably only got time really for one. So I'll, if you're able to answer this fairly quickly, uh, is there anything you can do to increase the number of cases um, where you get positive results that uh, uh, could help families to answer their questions? So this is what I briefly mentioned in the end. There's a novel technologies and there's a combination of whole genome sequencing with RNA sequencing that we now see can solve additional cases. But in the end, there's also going to be cases that will be explained by oligogenic inheritance, which I think will take a large numbers and it will be much more difficult to finalize it to be certain about. Well, uh, thank you very much for that, Pierre. Um, uh, we'll move on to our second speaker today, and that's um, Associate Professor Anna Brown. She's the Head of Molecular Oncology in the Department of Genetics and Mo Molecular Pathology uh, at SA Pathology, and again, part of the Centre for Cancer Biology. Uh, the title of Anna's presentation today is uh, Cancer Journeys Through Genomic Diagnosis and Research. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Peter. All right, so I'm going to give you a lightning tour of some of the activities in oncology and genomics that we've got going on, both in research and diagnostics at the Department of Genetics and Molecular Pathology at SA Pathology, uh, as well as some of our research groups based at the Centre for Cancer Biology building. So I think a good way of describing our department is an integrated department that has an ecosystem where we do basic research through to translational research and then do clinical diagnostics as well. And those things can feed off each other. Um, a lot of the research that we do in, in genomics development then becomes clinical diagnostic tests. Although, you know, as people who have pushed things into the clinic know that there are quite significant barriers in terms of turning something that's researched into an accredited clinical test and the resources uh, and um, parameters associated with that. We're not going to have time to go through all of the different things we have going on in terms of trying to give you a perspective of how things have changed over time. In some of these slides, I've put some, some timelines that you can look at while I'm talking. Um, and this one in particular shows that across our diagnostic department, we started off in genomics with cytogenetics or cytogenomics in the 1970s and have gradually moved through different technologies. And now we're doing, you know, a lot of next generation sequencing based at clinical testing. So one of our major research themes um, that is a co-run by myself and Hamish Scott and Chris Hahn is inherited blood cancer study called AFGUS. 
uh, where been going or Hamish has been working in this area since the late 1990s and this uh, study was established in early 2000s. So we're as a national study, we're a major referral center for Australia and New Zealand. We do both research and diagnostic. We've got over 200 families that are depicted here across a range of different hematological malignancies. There's a lot of genetic discovery that's going on with this cohort still, but we have over the years also identified um, predisposing germline mutations to solve a lot of these families. The majority of mutations that we found uh, tend to be in the category of myelodysplastic syndrome and AML predisposition. And one of the advantages, I guess, when Hamish moved the study or moved from Melbourne to here, uh, where there was a co-located clinical uh, lab, we've been able to offer germline clinical testing almost as discovery is occurring for lots of these, being the you know, world first lab many times to, to um, have new screening for a gene that's been discovered. Um, so initially Sanger sequencing, we've moved since the genomics facility, the ACRF genomics facility was established in 2012, moving most of these tests onto next generation sequencing, getting clinical accreditation for panels. Uh, and in 2015, we were the first lab in Australia to have clinical accreditation for whole exome sequencing. Um, we also have somatic and other ones I'll show you as we go through later. Um, so we've got a lot of activity going on where we will do about 1500 clinical NGS based tests this year. So now that in a lot of the MDS AML families, we've actually identified the underlying predisposition factors, um, which actually comes with accumulating a lot of carriers who don't yet have leukemia. We've moved um, some of our research into a sort of project looking at what happens between being born with a predisposition factor and at some point developing leukemia. So projects looking at internal and external stresses of the hemopoietic stem cell, and including somatic mutations that may be acquired during the process. And so we've got a lot of projects here that we do um, collaboratively with local people and all over the world. For example, the three most common uh, germline predisposition for MDS AML, we have defined mouse models where we now can, can tease out a hypothesis for stem cell stress and look at progression. Uh, with Jason Powell and Stuart Pitson um, at the CCB, we're for the first time looking at sort of germline mutated predisposed stroma and uh, human stem cells, primary material in their in vivo humanized ossicle system. And in all of these models, we can, you know, do downstream detailed cell and molecular profiling to compare and contrast the different things that might be important, pathways that are important in these disorders. We've also been world leaders in um, getting together international collaborations for, for rare diseases. So each of these diseases are quite rare on their own. So for example, we've established a RunX1, Germline RunX1 hub, where we've mapped all the families that were known worldwide and connected investigators across 52 centres. We've also um, done things like uh, establish a website portal, which is now a RunX1 database registry. So it's the first time there's a central place for all of the mutations that are known to be located and people get, can get logins and sort of access all of this data there. It's an interactive portal. You can add your own variants and um, they're all clinical grade um, classifications according to American College of Medical Genetics guidelines because we're members of the panels that are helped setting these guidelines. So we're using that clinical expertise in the research community as well. We have also been collecting genomics data from these rare diseases from all over the world for the first time to be able to create cohorts that are specific for a particular germline uh, gene mutation. So this is an example of a RUNX1 tumour cohort. Um, and we've finished a project we're writing up now where we've looked at the somatic mutations that are important in the leukaemia and we can show that germline RUNX1 leukaemia is different from sporadic leukaemia. So that information that we make available through our database in real time is helping shape where people who are investigating in this field um, can design their experiments based on that research. Another one hot off the press is we've actually started looking at somatic mutations in people before they get leukaemia and for the first time we can show that a third of patients who are uh, otherwise asymptomatic actually carry what look like leukemia associated mutations in their blood. So it's similar to clonal hematopoiesis if you're familiar with that phenomenon but we're showing that some of the genes are different genes and so therefore this is a special case that needs to be researched with a different emphasis. 
So our ability to do this is um, largely based on our in-house bioinformatics team and the software development team. So the bioinformatics team led by Andreas has been really good at helping us automate variant annotations. So we've moved away from sort of manual looking at variants in databases and spreadsheets to pipelines that will do it for you. And then we've got custom software developed by Dave Lawrence called Variant Grid that's really driving all of our genomics analysis. It's driving our database registries and repositories and allows us to do a whole range of different uh, clinical and research classifications. So I think we hit a new high of 700 analyses in variant grid last month and we'll have done 6,000 in 2020 alone. Um, all of that research activity that I showed you has helped in developing clinical panels. So the myeloid NGS clinical panel was released about a year ago, but we've really been developing different technologies since 2012, various industry partners, and then just such a rapid change. Um, and last year we uh, released this myeloid neoplasms panel that had 40 genes that were designed to do all the different diagnosis and things that I show here on the left. We, by the end of this year, we will already have made new diagnoses for 250 South Australians with technologies that couldn't be seen before. And we've done things we didn't expect like diagnosing leukemia in a baby before it's born and actually detecting really early relapse post-transplant, which exceed the performance expectations. So um, broader hemato hematology panels in development now due to clinical um, need, and that will be released next year. Uh, a second really big area of research, of course, is chronic myeloid leukemia headed by uh, Sue Brantford in the leukemia unit. For a long time, uh, her lab in collaboration with uh, Tim Cuse's group have been world leaders in detection of BCR ABLE, using it for monitoring in response to tyrosine kinases, uh, identifying resistance mutations, clinical trials now for treatment-free remission where people can actually come off their medicines and for defining sort of the molecular strategies that are now the standard international Nationally. Um, she's also been expanding the scope for CML beyond BCR able, looking at broader gene and RNA uh, lesions and showing that the patients who may be resistant or not respond to the, to the inhibitor therapy, there are other molecular targets that we can find that can be useful. Um, and a lot of this research has helped with our clinical accreditations for DNA and RNA sequencing, which we were the first um, centre in Australia to have RNA um, accredited. Solid tumour has lagged a little bit behind hematological malignancies, mainly because of the quality of the nucleic acids from the FFPE. Um, it's largely been overcome now. Our current test tests five genes using a gene oncofocus technology, but with the te um, technologies we've been testing for NGS, we now are going to be able to offer next year for around the same cost of 22 gene solid tumour NGS hotspot panel. And I think where cancer is going, it's already there in the clinical trial space, but hopefully it's going for everybody one day, uh, our comprehensive cancer profiling. So we were lucky enough to get MRFF funding as part of the Genomic Cancer Medicine Program trial, where we've implemented the TrueSight Oncology 500 Illumina assay, and it basically combines what would have been several separate assays previously into one package. It's really helpful for rare cancers without defined targets and people who have failed standard therapy and looking for another line of therapy. So in clinical trials, we've already done over 200 samples from 20 different tumor types. In our Adelaide sub-study, we've shown that this test can recommend some kind of therapy recommendation for over half of patients, with, which is an amazing hit rate. And next year, we're gonna be rolling this out to blood cancers as well. And if we can get all of the resourcing and staffing, we will do a clinical accreditation to make this release for broader use. Uh, so thanks for listening. I just need to thank all of the many, many people in research and diagnostics across the precinct who contribute to all of this work. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. I'm, I've, that's all right. I've got my video started. Uh, you get extra points for getting so much, for making so much information understandable in a, in such a short time. That was a very impressive presentation. Um, I, I, I don't have any questions in the uh, Q&A box at the moment, but um, one of the objectives of the uh, mini reviews is to highlight expertise and capability that exists on the campus. Uh, and to encourage new collaborations. So, um, I mean, you described some seriously impressive international collaborations in one of your slides, 
Um, are there areas of local collaboration that you think uh, would enhance the work that you're doing? Are there, is there any specific expertise or access to patients, access to data that, um, that you're looking to enhance? Yeah, I think we always are. I think we've got um, like a really close relationship with um, a lot of the haematologists. As you can see, we've been very active in this area. Um, and I think there's there's probably now that there's more genomics available, there's probably more areas that we could expand into uh, with the solid tumour to sort of catch them up to the haematological malignancy. So that would be a really, really good area. We've, we've obviously got some projects going already, but now that we've kind of overcome some of the technical hurdles for extracting that comprehensive genomic information from solid tumours, I think there's massive scope for, for doing more in that space than we have been in the past. All right, thanks. Um, I think there's time for one last question and we do have one, and I think we have to reward the one participant who's actually um, uh, lodged a question. So, um, will other non-cancer disorders make similar progress in genomics? Um, yeah, so, so I guess when I was saying how many tests we did in the department, that is across a whole a broad range of very different disorders. So, so our department is accredited for doing testing um, across a whole range of inherited disorders. Uh, so there's been, a, there's been a lot of progress in all of those fields in terms of, you know, identifying the genes that are important for different disorders. And you could see, I guess, from Piers' talk, something in action for one specific type of disorder. But that's true for most different disorders. So I think we're making extremely rapid progress. And at the same time, we're also clarifying all of the rules around being able to know when a gene variant that you find is actually the important one and pull it away from all of the background that you pick up from doing these broad assays. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, there are no more questions in the... Uh, uh, oh, sorry, there is one that has just come in. Will these database and collaborative links be of help for patients seeking bone marrow donors locally or overseas, or does this process occur via a different pathway? So I'm not a clinical haematologist, so I can't answer the exact way that they do the bone marrow registries at the moment. Um, we, I guess that's not necessarily the intent of ours, but what is a good question uh, around that is, when a bone marrow registry may be also gonna include genomic information on participants that might be relevant to their suitability of, of transplant. And examples of that could be um, if someone is unknowingly a carrier of a germline variant, um, if you had a routine genomic test, that would be able to, I guess, test the genetic health and be incorporated in those registries and also things like clonal hematopoiesis uh, um, that might be also a silent genetic thing, which in current, workups for bone marrow registries probably wouldn't be annotated at all. So I think I can see a way where we can combine the kind of data that we're generating with a bone marrow registry. All right, thank you very much. Um, look, we are um, uh, over time now, uh, only just, and we did start a little bit late, but thank you both for keeping very close to time. Um, so I'd like to thank both Pia and uh, Anna for their fabulous presentations today. I think we, um, uh, we can be very proud of what's being done here in uh, South Australia um, at SA Pathology and the University of South Australia. So thank you very much. Please join us again at 4.30 next Tuesday for the mini review. Thank you all very much. <laughs>